There was a common perception outside China that the Beijing Olympic Games involved a master plan to promote a positive image of China to the outside world, and that this was one of the major goals of hosting the Olympic Games, if not the major goal. Today, I want to argue that while there was widespread agreement in China that the Olympics were an excellent opportunity to promote an image of China to the world, the vast majority of the attention and effort was focused on the domestic audience, and that there was never a concrete communication strategy for dealing with the human rights issue, and that in both instances, China's ability to communicate a positive international image was hindered by domestic politics. Many Western journalists and Amnesty International accuse China of failing to keep its promises with respect to its human rights record. But China had not made any such promises. And if journalists had read chapter five of my recent book, Beijing's Games on Sale Outside the Door, they would have known that there was a big internal debate within the bid committee about even the one sentence about human rights that was made in China's bid presentation in 2001. However, in its bid, China did make one promise that it arguably kept, and that was its promise to host a People's Olympics. There were three main theme themes for the Olympic Games, the high-tech Olympics, the green Olympics, and the Renwen Olympics. Renwen is difficult to translate. It was sometimes translated as the humanistic Olympics, but after some debate, the preferred uh, official translation was the People's Olympics. This theme was originally intended as a response to the West's criticism of China's human rights. But this was never made explicit to the West, and ultimately, I think this function was not carried out. One of the central concepts of the People's Olympics was yi ren wei ban, uh, which means take people as the root, or a people orientation. This phrase had appeared in political rhetoric when Hu Jintao named it in his address to the third plenum of the 16th Party Congress in 2003. This preceded the inclusion of a passage on human rights in the revision to the Constitution in 2004. But it's interesting that as early as 2001, Yi Ren Wei Ban had already been written into the guiding thought for the Beijing Olympic Games. In 2000, Beijing Mayor Liu Qi began commissioning a number of groups with the task of developing the basic thought behind the People's Olympics because he felt that, unlike the other themes, it was unclear. The People's University, uh, Ren Min Da Xue, formed the Humanistic Olympic Studies Center to study it. One of the non-communist parties, the Democratic League, was commissioned by Liu Qi and began developing working papers in 2001. Forums were held, dissertations and books were written, working papers were drafted, and by the start of the games, it was estimated that at least 10,000 pages had been written on the topic of the People's Olympics. I was living at the Beijing Sport University during the year before the Games. Um, I was on a Fulbright Award to do research on the Games, and I was affiliated with the Olympic Studies Center there. I was interacting frequently with the major participants in the conceptualization and implementation of the People's Olympics. The faculty members of the Beijing Sport University had very close relationships with the State Sports General Administration and with BOCOG. BOCOG, of course, is the um, Beijing Organizing Committee for the Olympic Games. They functioned as perhaps the major academic think tank for both. They, along with faculty at other colleges administered by the Beijing municipal government, also provided the intellectual manpower for the educational programs in the schools and universities. The Humanistic Olympic Studies Center of the People's University was particularly involved in planning cultural programs and events. 
These intellectuals were all largely focused on the domestic audience and not the international audience. They gave dozens, if not hundreds, of interviews to Chinese media. They appeared frequently on CCTV. They were influential in shaping domestic media opinion. Although they had traveled abroad, most of them did not have fully functional spoken English. They seldom gave interviews to foreign media, and on occasions when they did, they were belittled as party liners. As a result of the orientation of the intellectuals who designed it, the guiding thought of the People's Olympics was largely diverted away from any focus on China's international image and into a debate over culture and education. In my interactions with Bocog and these intellectuals who were working with it, I felt that about 80 to 90 percent of the effort that went into this symbol making was directed toward the domestic audience. The main focus was on questions such as how to manage the combination of Eastern and Western cultures that the games were supposed to facilitate, the dong xi jie he how to promote Chinese culture within China and to the world, how to use the enthusiasm for the games to raise the general quality, or suzhi, of the people and the civility, or wenming, of the Chinese people, how to prepare the next generation of young Chinese to take their place in the international community. These discussions and debates formed the intellectual context for Zhang Yimou's opening and closing ceremonies. The Olympic education programs in the schools that reached as many as 400 million Chinese school children, the training programs for the 70,000 Olympic volunteers, the cultural performances in the Cultural Olympiad, and the myriad of other cultural and educational activities that surrounded the games. Perhaps the major way in which the guiding thought about the promotion of China's national image was generated was through three key point research projects commissioned by the National Planning Office of Philosophy and Social Science. This office is administered by the Central Propaganda Department. These grants are the government's way of channeling academic research in directions that serve its needs. The relative unimportance of the Beijing Olympic Games to the foreign propaganda effort is indicated by the fact that from 2003 to 2008, only five related projects were funded. Uh, three of them were key point projects, which means the office puts forward the project and um, solicits uh, sort of bids to, to take it on. By way of comparison, in the same time period, the number of funded projects that fell under the category of Marxist-Leninist services was 190, and under party history and construction was 178. Uh, the first relevant Olympic project was the 2003 project entitled Improving China's International Position and Reputation Through the 2008 Olympic Games. The Beijing Sport University won the bid for this project, and in April 2007, it published the results in a book. This book's 65 chapters contain thorough summaries of the issues that provoked negative media reports in past Olympic Games, such as delays in venue completion, transportation problems, media information glitches, terrorist acts, and so on. The lesson that Beijing clearly learned was that these particular problems should be avoided at all costs, and ultimately, they did avoid them all the problems that got negative media coverage in previous Olympics. But since human rights had not been a hot issue for previous Olympic Games since, perhaps, Berlin, 1936, there were no historical lessons about how to handle that issue. The analyses uh, in this book of Western media coverage of the Beijing Games since 2001 indicated that what they call political issues would dominate coverage. However, the resulting recommendations merely emphasize the importance of treating the media and other important opinion makers well, which was done. 
Um, the most daring chapter, which is entitled Beijing Olympics Speed Up the Transformation of the Functioning of the Government, analyzes the promises made under the rubric of the People's Olympics, and significantly, human rights is not listed as one of them. Um, there's another chapter that discusses the risk that the uh, quote-unquote human rights problem will become even more sensitive. Uh, this is, you know, the um, required by the TIFA, the Chinese censorship standard. Um, you put human rights in square, scare quotes, which implies that the problem does not actually exist. Um, there are no concrete recommendations in this chapter either of how to handle the problem except uh, for one of the recommendations, which is avoid separatism and internal disorder. <laughs> Uh, another key point project of the National Planning Office uh, was a 2006 project on the construction of the humanistic concept, social value, and national image of the 2008 Beijing Games. This was awarded to the People's University. Through this project and elsewhere, the People's University promoted its concept of the cultural Olympics. Um, the final report has not been completed yet, but in a summary of their conclusions on CCTV in February, they argued that research um, on national image shows that culture constitutes the core of national image, and therefore, uh, and this is a quote, therefore in the construction of a national image, we should hold the line uh, on cultural China and the Chinese Chinese's we should hold the line in order to make the idea of cultural China into the core theme for dialogue between China and the international community in Olympic discourse. So the first point I want to make today is that if the People's Olympics was the response to the West's human rights accusations, then that response was delivered in the form of culture and symbols, the look and image of the games, the branding of China, the display of Chinese culture. And it was not delivered in the form of verbal debate or dialogue. Of course, the Olympic Games, um, people generally agree, were very successful in the former, but the absence of the latter led critics to characterize the games as one big show orchestrated by the party state. And I, I would like to say today, this simple-minded view does not do justice to the passion with which the producers of the People's Olympics threw themselves into fulfilling their mission of promoting Chinese culture and achieving its integration with Western culture. And I believe we should accord them more respect. If the People's Olympics was to be the response to the Western criticism of China's human rights record, then it probably needed to directly address the issue of human rights. But the topic was never taken on in the reports and research devoted to, the, to, to this topic. But now we enter the realm of domestic censorship. These sports scholars, philosophers, and members of non-communist parties who were developing these documents were not likely to address such a sensitive topic as human rights, because it was not their job. Um, moreover, they had a vested interest in promoting Olympic communication strategies that fell under their purview. So, for example, the People's University was very active in designing the cultural program surrounding the Olympics and had some input into shaping the opening ceremonies. So it had a vested interest in pushing the idea that they should adhere to the policy of promoting cultural China in the face of political criticism. Now, the job of communicating China's position on human rights to the outside world is one of the official responsibilities of the State Council's Information Office, which is simultaneously the Office of Foreign Propaganda of the Central Committee of the Communist Party. This organ's function is to act as the media conduit between China and the outside world. But the information office did not appear to be taking any proactive communication measures except for the Olympics link on the English version of the China Human Rights webpage, which did not contain even one article that discussed human rights in conjunction with the Olympics. 
And the Chinese version of the web page did not even have an Olympics link. The information office is under the Party Central Committee's propaganda department, which is the nerve center of China's thought control system. But the factionalism between the various systems, or xitong, of the Chinese government is well known. The propaganda system is a different system from the sport, cultural, and educational systems involved in the People's Olympics. Its power base is in media and communication circles. I haven't found any evidence that it had an active role in conceptualizing the People's Olympics. So while the other systems were doing their work, the information office was involved in a separate effort, which involved a different group of intellectuals in the field of communications, whose core was located at the Communications University of China. The question of China's national image had been subject um, to a fair amount of intellectual work, but not nearly as much as the multidisciplinary effort behind the People's Olympics. So a third relevant key point project uh, designated by the National Planning Office for Philosophy and Social Science was the 2005 project on the design of China's national image in communications with the outside world. This was awarded to the Foreign Communications Research Center, a unit administered by the Foreign Languages Publishing Bureau, which is in turn under the Party Central Committee. The major results of this project, which involved scholars in communications at China's top universities, were published in April of 2008. Uh, the book's name was Communication of a National Image. Among the 60 chapters, there is not one on the Beijing Olympics. Uh, there are chapters that touch upon the Olympic Games, and they agree that they're an excellent opportunity to promote a national image, but they use the examples of the Tokyo 1964 and Seoul 1988 Olympics as models for promoting a positive image, and they don't offer the possibility that the games can promote a negative image. And so three years of work by China's top communications intellectuals failed to produce a strategy for dealing with attacks and criticism. If there had been a master plan for using the Olympics to promote China's image, it would have been developed by the Central Propaganda Department. The single person most responsible for coordinating it would have been Li Dongsheng. He was simultaneously a member of the Party Central Committee, Vice Minister of the State Administration for Industry and Commerce, and more to the point here, Deputy Director of the Central Propaganda Department, Chief of BOCOG's Media and Communications Coordination Group, and President of the China Advertising Association. A major reason that I have concluded that there was no master plan is based on my own involvement in the Information Office's effort to produce a television commercial for China at the end of 2007. The difficult eight-month birthing process of what was known as the Olympic China National Image Ad indicates that if Li Dongsheng were trying to develop more proactive communications with the outside world, he may have had his opponents. The ad had been approved in January of 2007, but due to internal debates, it was shelved for almost one year until December. It was finally pushed through at the last minute before the end of the fiscal year while the allocated funding was still available. Pressure was exerted via a long article entitled, Raise China's Face, Where is China's National Image Ad? Which appeared in the December 2007 issue of Modern Advertising Magazine, which is a publication of the China Advertising Association of which Li Dongsheng was president. The article was written with the help of scholars at the Communication University of China, and it demonstrated the widespread, widespread support of the heads of China's major advertising firms for, for a national image ad. Um, like the other publications, it reviews um, using the opportunity of the Olympics to build a national image, um, touches upon the risk of negative media coverage, but does not develop a communication strategy for responding to it. 
I was invited to be on the panel of academics that evaluated the bid presentations by eight of the top advertising offices, uh, advertising agencies with offices in China. The bid process was extremely rushed for reasons not entirely clear to me. One part of it was the fear of attempts to bribe the panel members. Another factor appeared to be the political sensitivity of the project. After the, leaving the hotel where we were sequestered, I was never able to get any more information about the project until the ad was shown on CNN and BBC on August 8th, the day of the opening ceremony. I still have not seen the ad, and if anyone else has any information on it, I'd appreciate if you could let me know. Its release had been delayed from the original plan date of April because of the torch relay protests and the earthquake. There's no information about it on the website of the information office, which seems to me uh, like they were trying to avoid attention. I was able to find local reports on the internet in which cities proudly report that they were selected to appear in it, but these reports make it seem that the project was not finally awarded to one of the advertising firms that made the bid presentations, but rather to a production team formed by the information office. And I would say that for, from what I observed in the bid presentations, I can understand why this happened. The multinational firms did not have a, have a good enough understanding of China to produce something that Chinese people would feel was true to China. The Chinese firms did not have a good enough understanding of the international audience to produce something that would appeal to them. Uh, at the time, we were told that we were making history because for the first time, China was reaching out to the world to try to shape its image rather than waiting for the world to come and understand it. Those involved in the process seemed to feel that this was an extremely important first step. Uh, they had also been very nervous about including a foreigner in the process, and they were afraid that I would not look favorably upon the government control exercised over the process. It seemed illogical for Chinese people to choose the best communication strategy without testing the idea on foreigners, but it was clear that it was more important to please their leaders and the domestic audience than to appeal to the foreign audience. In December 2007, the information office had already expressed to me that it knew it was not effective in communicating a positive image of China to the world. It clearly felt it needed a new strategy for dealing with the human rights issue because in December of 2008, just two months ago, it announced that together with the foreign ministry, it was spearheading China's first ever action plan on human rights which would be prepared for release in January by a panel including 50 institutions and NGOs and 10 intellectuals. That this effort was spearheaded by the information office and foreign ministry and not by the ministries and offices that actually control human rights has led Western critics to describe it as a public relations ploy. But I would point out that because these are the organs that interface with the outside world, they are probably better versed on human rights debates than any others in China. Also, the Chinese announcement does state that it will not be just another white paper on human rights, but an actual action plan with benchmarks. I think a more optimistic interpretation of this measure might be that China's international image is now being enlisted in a strategy to name and shame the other state organs into closer adherence to international human rights standards. But we can only wait and see how this plays out. Thank you.